We study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel, and we have extra copies. If you didn't bring one with you and you'd like one to follow along, raise your hand up real high, real high, real high, and uh, somebody will come around and uh, drop one off at your row, your aisle, and uh, that way you can follow along. Starting a brand new book today, this is the book known as Romans, and uh, we'll take uh, the first 17 verses from this uh, chapter Number one, a little bit of background on the book, as I always like to do. I think it's important when we uh, take a look at a, a book from the 66-book library we call the Bible to uh, find out what kind of literature we're, we're talking about, where the context was, in which it was written, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm looking, and there's a whole bunch of people standing. Anybody have an empty seat, empty chairs? If you're in the back and you want a chair, move forward uh, with great haste and you can just take one of these chairs. It's really helpful. It's really okay. Everybody smells great this morning. You can s come sit next to somebody if you'd like to. Awesome, wonderful. Okay, Romans chapter 1. Back to uh, what I was doing there. I want to do a little setup for us if we can. Uh, literary genre, always important to find out what that is. This is a letter. This is an epistle, as it's called, an old uh, ancient term for letter. It's not um, it wasn't designed when Paul sat down to write this. He didn't say, I'm going to do a doctrinal treatise on justification by faith. Um, however, he does talk about justification by faith. Um, but it wasn't intended to be his uh, uh, doctoral thesis or some PhD paper or something like that. It's a letter. I like reading other people's mail, do you? <laughs> it's just kind of fun. Sorry, I'm just kind of curious. What's in there? You know, what is that? What are they saying? You know, that kind of thing. So we got to remember as we study something like this that there was, a, uh, there was someone who wrote it and someone it was written to. And it's important. It'll help us, I think, as we uh, seek to be faithful with our hermeneutic, our interpreting this particular kind of literature, and uh, even then applying it to our own lives. We want to begin with that sort of idea. What is, what is this? All right, so it's a letter. It's an ancient letter. And it was written to a certain group of people in a certain city. And uh, there was some stuff going on. And, um, and the guy that's writing it speaks a certain way. And he's had a lot of stuff going on in his life, too. And we just need to know that and be aware of that as we prepare to study. Author and date, Paul, is identified right at the top. Um, the date of, well, uh, I should tell you, he uses a fella named Tertius. Uh, Tertius, uh, Romans 16 tells us, the last chapter, uh, as a scribe, somebody that's helping him write this out, and so he'll be mentioned later. Um, he is probably writing in 57 AD, that's our best guess, I think, uh, probably from Corinth, where he is uh, stopped off for a bit and has a place where he can do some writing. I, I hope he had a you know, a nice place where he could go, a nice writing room where it would be quiet and he could focus. It seems like it because, man, what I read here is pretty amazing, pretty profound, and, uh, and uh, so glad that, uh, that we have this ancient letter. Recipients, uh, his readers, he identifies them pretty much early on here, but not till verse 7. So this is one of the longer salutations or greetings uh, of one of his letters. Uh, the first six verses are spent... Uh, identifying himself before he ever says, you know, two. And then he gets to two in, in verse seven, and we'll find out that that's all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. His purpose in writing appears to me to be threefold. I mean, you could, you could probably identify his purpose a couple different ways, and different commentators uh, do indeed emphasize different kinds of things. Sometimes I think we, um, we just we're in the place ourselves where we read something and we, we need to hear X, Y, Z, and it speaks to us, and so it's profound, it has an impact on us, and that's what we remember about, for me anyway, as I read it, I, I seem to get the sense that he wants to clarify the gospel for his readers. I seem to get the sense that he wants to nurture unity in the body of Christ. And it seems to me when I read this letter and have read it multiple times that he wants to inspire them to join God in God's mission in this world. All three of those things are really important for that time as well as for our own. It's really important that we clarify the gospel as a church and that we remind ourselves over and over again of the gospel. I don't know about you, but I forget. And I don't know about you, but I've been steeped in performance-based living in almost every category of my life. 
And so this thing called the gospel that is not sort of a call for you to do something or me to do something, but it's actually a declaration, a proclamation of what Christ has done, it's, I find myself having to be reminded over and over again because I, I believe in the gospel of grace, but I sometimes function as somebody that operates as if I got to earn his love or somehow or another appease his anger or somehow or another get him to look another way and, and, and not be angry at me because my concept of the gospel seems to get thinned out or I forgot it fades or it gets mixed with performance-based thinking. And so it's really important to clarify the gospel. It's really important to talk about unity of the body of Christ. That's really important. All we have to work with is sinners. I don't know if you've noticed that in the church. Um, and, uh, you know, um, that means that we're going to have some friction and we're going to, uh, there are going to be times where we really need this dynamic thing called living together in the community of faith. We need that um, unifying factor that, that comes from, not from us just trying to be good Southerners, but from the Holy Spirit knitting our hearts together in a powerful way that we couldn't do on our own. Uh, and we need that. So he's going to talk about that as he talks to Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians who are both living together in a city um, where the Jews in 49 AD had been run out of Rome by Claudius, the emperor. He did that because Suetonius, the historian, says they were arguing back and forth over this person, Crestus. Is that Suetonius misspelling Christ in some way, some reference to Christ? I, I don't know. It might be. Seems like it could be. Um, but he runs Jews, and including the Jewish people who have become Christians, out of Rome. And then what's left in the Christian churches, mostly house churches, I'm sure, would be Gentile Christians. And so since 49 AD, the Jewish Christians have been gone. Then when Emperor Claudius dies in 54, and Nero takes back over, the edict is rescinded, and now the Jewish Christians start to come back. And you've got a Gentile Christian church that has for several years run on its own, and now the Jewish Christians are coming back, and they want to be the elders and the pastors and the friction that that could bring. You can imagine what that might be like, can't you, if you just think a little and uh, try to imagine that. So Paul writes to unify, to nurture unity among these believers who are some Gentiles, some Jewish Christians. He wants to inspire them in the mission uh, that God is about doing in the world as well. So um, before we read, you've got to know that there are a whole lot of people that have been impacted in just massive ways by the book of Romans. I mean, it goes all the way back to you know, people like Augustine, you know, uh, people like here, this quote, Martin Luther up on the screen, really the chief part of the New Testament, truly the purest gospel, it is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but also that he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. So for the next 20 weeks, would you come with me? We're going to eat some daily bread for the soul found in the book of Romans. It's going to be really awesome. I'm looking forward to it. It's the first time we've done this kind of literature from one of the books of the Bible on Sunday mornings. We tend to do narrative passages or ancient songs like the Psalms or some of the prophetic minor prophet books. We've done those before. But uh, first time we've done one of these epistles as, that I can recall in a long, long time. Uh, John Calvin said of the book of Romans, if we've gained a true understanding of this epistle, we have an open door to all the most profound treasures of Scripture. And when you think about how many profound treasures of Scripture there are, this is an open door. Let's walk through it together for the next 20 weeks or so. William Tyndale, one of the fathers of uh, uh, biblical translation, translating the ancient uh, manuscript copies that we have into languages of the day, of the time, if you will, William Tyndall. The principal, most excellent part of the New Testament, most pure euangelion, that is to say the, the glad tidings, euangelion, the good news, okay? Also a light and a way unto the whole scripture, in and unto the whole scripture. So this is what he thought of the book of Romans. Um, really beautiful. Uh, let's study together for the next 20 weeks and let it be a little bit of a light. Uh, illuminating the way for us as we seek to understand some of these amazing treasures that are in and throughout the entire scripture. You, what would it be at the Village Chapel without a stot quote? So here you go, yeah. 
Um, it was Paul's devastating exposure of universal human sin and guilt in Romans 1, 18 to 3.20, which rescued me, John Stott said, from that kind of superficial evangelism, which is preoccupied only with people's felt needs. Ooh, maybe a little uncomfortable for some of you to hear that. Um, I was told when I wrote my books to make sure to get to the heartfelt need. Um, does that mean felt needs are evil? No, they're not. But let's just, let's don't stop at the veneer surface level stuff. Let's dig a little deeper. I got to tell you, as a Bible teacher, I feel like the 800-pound gorilla that's holding a really beautiful sapphire ring right now, getting ready to unpack this book. I don't think I belong here. Um, it's really an amazing letter. And the riches that we will mine together, I think, can have a huge impact on our lives. And one last quote from Packer before we read this text. Um, his view of the impact, all roads in the Bible lead to Romans. All views afforded by the Bible are seen most clearly from Romans. When the message of Romans gets into a person's heart, there's no telling what may happen. So if you ask, well, why, Pastor Jim, are we studying the book of Romans? Because there's no telling what may happen. <laughs> And a 15-year-old church, and by the way, we're 15 years old, February 11th. Yeah. So a 15-year-old church that's getting its driver's permit finally <laughs> to think that there's no telling what might happen as we started the book of Romans, I, that kind of gets me a little excited for us as a church. No telling what may happen to me as a Bible teacher, no telling what may happen to you as... Uh, faithful members of this church and members of this faith community. There's no telling what, man. I think, he's, I think Packer's right on that whole deal. So uh, looking forward to how Romans may provide a salubrious um, con uh, 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 means of, of uh, uh, sort of a, a catalyst to, to health, to spiritual health for us. Um, it'll have that kind of impact, I think, if we lean in. Uh, and receive some of the riches that are on offer to us. All right, so here we go. Verses 1 through 17, chapter 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, writing in 57 AD, all the way back then from Corinth, a city riddled with idolatry and immorality, sexual perversion of every kind, spiritual distortion and manipulation of all kinds. And in the middle of all of that, he writes this beautiful letter, the gospel of God, it, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't know if you've connected it yet, but he keeps referring to Old Testament sort of connections to Jesus and ways that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament things, like what the prophets spoke about God's promised Messiah, that David, uh, one of his descendants, would be put on David's throne and it would be eternal. And this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is of the lineage, the line of David. And so Paul, writing to Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians in Rome, is right from the very beginning, he's saying, this isn't something new that we just, it's, some no, it's not some novel new religion or some wave, new wave of something that's happening. This is something God's been doing for a really long time. Because for a really long time, God's been in pursuit of a people he can call his own. And he's done everything necessary to make it possible for you and I to become his people, his sons, his daughters, not just by ownership, but by relationship. And uh, it's really beautiful that he's doing this. Through whom we have received grace, and by the way, that's the only way you can get grace. If you need grace, you can't buy it, you can't earn it, you just have to receive it. That's on God's terms. You must receive it God's way. And God's way for you to uh, ever have any kind of grace whatsoever is for you to fall to your knees, lift up the empty hands of faith, and receive as a free gift something you can't buy, you can't earn, 
by being a good little boy or a good little girl or a good little southerner or a good little village chapelite. It's just not going to happen. You've got to receive his grace. And then you also, as a benefit, you get his peace as well. He always does that kind of thing when he talks about grace. A little few, little few verses down uh, later, we'll, we'll hear him talk about grace and peace in verse 7. So, so he's declared this son of God, Jesus, with this power of the resurrection, which is unique in all of history, of course, that a dead man got up and walked. And I love the way Paul always connects the resurrection of Jesus to the uh, authority and the, the credibility of the gospel itself, that God has broken into history and reversed even the darkest thing that happens, which is death itself, in the person and work of Jesus. Really powerful. We've received grace and apostleship, verse 5, to bring, all, uh, to bring about, rather, the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. So it's for God's name's sake that your faith would actually turn into obedience, not just be mere academic assent or ag acknowledgement of the existence of God. The devil has that. But, and, and this isn't faith plus works, by the way. This is just faith that works. There's a big difference. Um, salvation is a free gift to you. You must receive it. You can't earn it or work for it. But once you receive it, there's a result to that, and it begins to change your life. Your faith in God begins to alter and, and change your behavior, your beliefs, your worldview has changed. Everything has changed. You become what the New Testament calls a new creation in Christ. Who doesn't need more of that? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It's good. So, um, so we have this, this power of the resurrection at work in us, and Jesus Christ our Lord, and he's the, 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 the one who God expresses his grace to us. It's given to us as a gift, and it's all for his name's sake. Verse 6, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Two. Now we get to two. So verses 1 through 6 are all of his, I'm Paul, I'm an apostle, and here's this thing called the gospel, and now two, verse seven, finally. Again, this is his longest opening that I know of. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace. And it's always in that order, isn't it? From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so you're beloved of God. Um, this letter, I think by extension, is written to us as well. So to all who are beloved of God in Rome and to all who are beloved of God in Nashville as well. I don't think we're stretching it at all to receive that by extension as we read this and begin to study it because he's certainly going to make that point that God loves sinners uh, and that we are his beloved. That's a really, that's a life changer right there, isn't it? First, verse 8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers making request of perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. I long to see you. Is this not a beautiful heart that is writing to these people? Beautiful pastor's heart. He loves these people. He doesn't see them as an inconvenient thing that he's got. I got to take care of the, oh, the, don't forget the church in Rome, you know. He's not doing that. He, he wants to visit them. He longs to, he's heard of their faith. He, they, they're, it's, it's a beautiful relationship, even though he hasn't been there, even though he didn't found this church, he didn't start this church. Um, we'll see tonight, those of you who come back, we're going to study Philippians beginning tonight in the evening service. Paul's got an amazing pastor's heart. He loves the people that he has been sharing the gospel with. And so he is writing for the very first time and he, to, to this church and introducing himself to them. And he's talking about how he serves God in the preaching of the gospel. And he's longing to see them and to impart some spiritual gift to them. Verse 11, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, yours and mine. And so this is awesome. This is great. He recognizes, that even though he's an apostle, he too can benefit from being with them and to, to go and be with them and to... to impart some spiritual gift to them at the same time is to gain from them as well, to be encouraged or strengthened by them as well. And that's exactly why we gather every single Sunday, 
to encourage one another, to remind each other of the things that matter, to encourage one another to have confidence in God, and to sharpen one another, and to hold one another accountable. That's why the Christian faith is really not for people who want to isolate and just kind of you know, become some ascetic where you just withdraw from everything and, 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 and live up on a mountaintop all by yourself. And, and, and sort of just you and God. Hey, you know, people annoy me too, you know, and I'm sure, I'm sure I annoy people. I know I do, as a matter of fact. I'm positive of it. I'm very aware of it. Um, uh, and someone's thinking of you right now, actually, by the way. Just, we're, we're all in this together, okay? So, um, yeah, but we need each other. And Paul makes that abundantly clear, doesn't he, as he writes to the church at Rome. I really love this. Um, I long to see you. He wants to share together. Verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I've planned to come to you and have been prevent, prevented thus far in order that I might obtain some fruit or some harvest among you also. As he's talking spiritually here, he, he would like to go and minister there and, and, and that for there to be some fruit uh, uh, as a result of, of, of being there, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. And remember, Paul was commissioned by Jesus to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he's here he's just in his own mind's eye he can see how awesome that would be to be together and to minister to encourage one another and to for him to start to see some spiritual fruit there as well and i love uh, verse 14 15 and 16 each have an i am statement you might want to circle the i am in 14 15 and 16. We'll talk about it just a little bit more in a minute. But he says, I'm under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Some of your translations will say both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. What's he saying here? Is there, has he got some racial prejudice against Greeks or maybe against non-Greeks? What is it? Well, remember, our New Testament has three contexts, okay? The political context is Rome. The Roman Empire is in power. It followed on the heels of the Greek Empire. And so the cultural context of our New Testament is still Greek culture. Okay, a lot of people speak the Greek language uh, in and around throughout the Mediterranean, even though it's the Roman Empire. So we have a political context that's Roman, we have a cultural context that's Greek, and we have a religious context for most of our New Testament writings. And the religious context is Jewish, okay? Even though we're talking about the Christian faith, they're coming out of uh, the Jewish faith and Jewish tradition and roots and history. And so he's often, as Paul travels around on his missionary journeys, he's often stopping in at a Jewish synagogue. And he begins there to share the gospel so often. In some cities, there are no Jewish synagogues. And so he, he just goes and preaches wherever the Lord seems to send him. But for this uh, part here, I love these three I am's. I'm under obligation to really, you could say, to because for Jews, it was, you're either Jewish or you're a Gentile. That's the two kind of, those are the two kinds of people on the planet, Jews or Gentiles, okay? In the Greek mindset, there were Greeks and there were barbarians. They were educated with Greek culture or they weren't educated with Greek culture. And that's all, that's kind of what this is, is saying. He's under obligation to everybody, no matter what level of sophistication or education they may have, no matter what their cultural milieu may have been as they have grown up. He, Paul, is under obligation because of the mercy and grace that he's received. He's under obligation to share that with everybody without exception. I love this. Verse 15, thus for my part, I am, there it is again, eager I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So in other words, personally speaking, the gospel is for everybody. Personally speaking, I can't wait to get to Rome. I'm eager for you. You know, I love this. I like that. For I am, there it is again, not ashamed of the gospel. And this really, if, if this were sort of a, a, a paper, an academic paper, and it needed a thesis, I think verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1 are the thesis. This is, this, is the, this is what the whole letter is about, okay? So if you, if you want to highlight a couple of verses in your Bible or underline or put asterisk, even if it's in the Pew Bible, go ahead and do it, verses 16 and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. I love this. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he goes on to say, verse 17, for in it, what's it? The gospel. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And some of your translations may say that a little bit differently because the little word to can be translated a couple different ways. 
Uh, but I think, the, I think the idea here is that the gospel unfolds in our lives, and it's the power of God at work in our lives, and we, we move, we progress in our understanding of the gospel, and that's why he's writing to them. He wants to continue to help clarify the gospel for them. Uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As we grow in faith, we, we start to see the righteousness of God. Uh, that could be a divine attribute, or that could be a divine action in his life or in our lives as we begin to see God's righteousness growing in our hearts and minds. And the old us, the old part of us, changing into that new creature in Christ. You know, I love that. That's beautiful. Um, from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. This is a quote from Habakkuk chapter 2. Um, and this, of course, is a very, very powerful verse that had a huge impact uh, on a whole lot of people down through history. But all right, let me just highlight a couple of things because I want to stop there for today, and we'll pick up in verse 18 uh, next week. The righteousness of God, as I say, could be seen as a divine attribute. God is righteous. A divine activity, God's acts are always righteous. Um, it could also be seen uh, as the righteous status that he bestows upon those who put their hope, faith, and confidence in Jesus. Uh, which one is it? All three. Really happy to have that kind of tension in my theology. Because I think all three are true. I think he's righteous. I think our God is righteous. And I think he acts in righteousness in this world. And I'm really glad he does. We'll study next week, verses 18 to 32. And the, if I, I don't title my sermons hardly ever, but if I were, I would say, why God is right to be angry at my sin. That might be what I call it. And why it's really good for me that he's actually right to be angry at my sin. Uh -huh. Yeah, you don't, want to come, you don't want to miss that. That's going to be, not because I'm going to tell you about my sin. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about all of our sin. No. Nobody will be left standing next week, all right? So uh, just, just come with that in mind and, and, and come prepared to rejoice, though, in, in God's redeeming love for sinners such as we are. So two slides for you, and then uh, we'll let you go. Um, seven things about clarifying the gospel. And we'll, we'll cruise these really fast. So when I say seven things, some of you are going, oh, no, the roast is going to burn. The crock pot is going to become cement. No, it's not. Trust me. We're going to go fast here. In this short passage, and I could argue just in verses 16 and 17, we got seven things about the gospel. The nature of the gospel. It's good news. Evangelion. It's good news. That's what it, it is. It's not a call for you to do something religious. It's the clarification, the, the, the proclamation uh, of what has been done for you. This is good news. See, that's why we call it good news. Now, to listen to some preachers, you might not think it's good news. You might think that being a Christian and studying the Bible uh, leaves you with a sour, dour, wrinkled face, and you, you, you become sort of curmudgeonly for the rest of your life. So being, becoming a saved or born-again person means to be grumpy. Um, that is not true. I, I think there's a great cause for rejoicing for us because this is really, really good news. So the nature of it, the gospel is good news. The source of it is of God. Um, this is beautiful in verse... Uh, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God. The source of the gospel is not human discovery. The source of the gospel is divine revelation. It's of God. It's found in God taking the initiative and doing something to break into the darkness of our world and our sin condition where we don't love God, we don't want to hear from God, we want to self-deify, we want to be our own God, and we live that way practically, and he breaks in. So this initiative, this source, this fountainhead of this good news is God himself um, doing something, taking action. We are heralds of this good news. Uh, we need to be uh, less moral policemen, and I think that's what a lot of, sadly, what a lot of modern-day churchianity can become is sort of the moral therapeutic deistic approach to Bible study and to, to, to preaching. 
Um, so we become then moral policemen handing out tickets to people who are sinning. Now, we need to be gospel paramedics, not moral policemen. Gospel paramedics simply taking the good news out there to those who so desperately need to hear it. And I would argue so many of them that are more ready than we realize to hear it. So why so timid? Why so quiet are we, church? We should be, this is good news. Uh, you might be timid because you, you only know how to share the gospel, you know, in, in terms of religious rule following. Well, I'm timid about that too. Nobody wants to hear that. I don't want to hear that. But to hear that there's a God that loves me even though I'm running the other way, wait a minute, I'm at least curious about that. Uh, to hear that there's a God that loves me even though I'm bound up by my own addictions and my own greed and my own arrogance and my own lust and all that stuff, to hear that there's a God that loves me in spite of all that, that I, while I'm a sinner, he still loves me? I'm curious about that. That's good news, and it's sourced in God. The dynamic of the gospel is the power of God, so it's not just a, a set of propositions, although I believe in propositions, but this is not a plastic propositional proposal. I love alliteration. <laughs> this is not that. This is the power of God. And when we share the gospel, when we preach the gospel, there's something going on that we who are the, you, who, all of us, as we are sharing, we got not, we're not really doing this. He's doing something. And only he can do that. I don't know if you've learned it, this yourself, but I have learned in my own life, I really make a crummy Holy Spirit, even though I try so often to be the Holy Spirit. I'm probably the worst Holy Spirit I know. Um... Um, uh, you, you, know, you may have learned that about yourself as well. Um, so resign, okay? You're not the Holy Spirit. I'm not the reason. Let's let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit, okay? Let's let him do what he does. Convict us of our sin. Convince us of what's true. Conform us into the image of Christ. That's what he does. Uh, again, moral policemen are trying to convict others of their sin, and usually all they're thinking about is what someone else is doing. They're not thinking about their own sin. They're thinking about somebody else's sin, you know. Um, dynamic of the gospel. It's the power of God. The purpose of the gospel for salvation. It says it right there. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. This God of the Bible, who has revealed himself in the personal work of Jesus Christ, is eager to save. This is the purpose of the gospel. It's good news for salvation. Who wouldn't want that? I mean, literally, I'm the dog with his head out the window at this point when I'm thinking about this. This is awesome. Who wouldn't want that? For salvation. As a free gift. You know, to you, to me. This is awesome, right? The scope of the gospel to everyone. This is an offer to no small group. It is a universal offer. Some will believe, others will not. Some will respond, others will not. I leave that up to God. Salvation belongs to our God, Psalm 3, verse 8 tells us. But I know that my job is simply to share the gospel and leave the results up to God. So let's do that, you know, awesome, yeah. So the scope of it is share it with everyone. The means of the gospel, who believes? Uh, the gospel is an invitation for us to believe, to repent from our self deification turn to Jesus as Savior, bow the knee before him mentally, intellectually, morally, in every single way to surrender every bit of who I am to every bit of who he is, <laughs> to exchange my failed, uh, my, my failed attempts at self-deification, my failed attempts at self-salvation, to surrender all of that, to lay it down, and just become his bond slave, as Paul says, his, his servant, to belong to him. It's really amazing. Um, belief, faith, trust in him. This is the means of gospel. And the center, of course, is Jesus himself. Calvin said, the whole gospel is contained in Christ. It's not contained in, and you could fill in so many other things. It's just the, the, the Christian gospel is about Jesus, okay? What do we do with Jesus? How do we respond to Jesus? Um, we get it 
so convoluted sometimes, especially with the forms of our faith become too important to us. You know, it's, it becomes more important to us the, how much water we use for baptizing or what kind of chandeliers we have hanging from the ceiling or what color the paint is in the sanctuary, the carpet, or whatever it might be. We get so all dusted up about that stuff. And it's a far cry from Jesus because this is about Jesus. In Romans, all sinners, meaning all people, are humbled before a holy, righteous God. Romans levels the playing field for all of us. No room for competition. No buddy is better or worse than someone else. There's no room for superiority. And by the way, there's also no room for inferiority. If you struggle with inferiority, I'm going to invite you to believe in the God who levels the playing field. And there's no room for inferiority. There's no room for superiority either because the, all of the ground at the foot of the cross is level. And we must all come and surrender um, before him. Hearing all of this, I think, promotes uh, all of those things that the Apostle Paul was looking to do as he uh, writes to them. He, ta- he defines himself in at least these five ways. I belong to Christ. I'm a doulos. I'm a slave. Uh, I think a lot of people are under the delusion they belong to themselves. I think we've reminded ourselves around here over and over again, we don't belong to ourselves. Some of us go through life thinking we belong to ourselves. Others go through life thinking we belong to our career. Others go through life thinking we belong to our political views. Others go through life thinking we belong to our sexuality. Whatever it might be, the Bible just says, nope. Those who follow Jesus belong to Jesus. It's all about him. We're his, uh, and we belong to him lock, stock, and barrel. I'm an apostle. Uh, just means a sent one. And, and there's a sense in which we're all sent ones. Um, so in a very, very, very watered-down sense, I'm an apostle, you're an apostle. Uh, but I'm probably more like a B or a C apostle instead of an A apostle. Maybe a double Z apostle. I don't know. We're way down the line. I'll tell you that for sure. Yeah. Um, Paul was an A apostle, though, and there's a very unique thing about the A apostles. They saw the risen Lord. He saw him in a vision. Jesus appeared to him. But so the other uh, 11 sat around campfires with Jesus, heard Jesus preach what we call the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm raised. Some of them did. Jairus' daughter from the dead and the widow of Nain's son and Lazarus from the dead saw him get up uh, from the dead himself a few days later. They saw him alive. Over 500 of them did. Um, but yeah, there's a unique sense in which uh, Paul has apostolic authority in a way that none of us ever will. But this is beautiful because that's why we can um, receive this, this faith once handed down, once for all. And, uh, and that's good. That's a good thing for us. Um, he says, I'm under obligation. I'm eager. and I'm not ashamed. We've already talked about those just a little bit. And I love that. I, I I'm inspired by that. All of these things actually inspire me when I look at uh, him. He's not the champion or the hero. He's not my savior, but he's my older brother in the Lord. And I want to ask myself, myself and I hope us, the, que- the questions about these five things as we read through here. Uh, who do you belong to? You know, what do you, or what do you belong to? Um, what are you sent out? What is your mission? What really is at the center for you? of your mission in life? What makes your life meaningful? What's at the center? That's, these are good questions to ask ourselves. This is why Romans is so timeless. Um, and what do, you under, what do you think you're under obligation to do? What do you think is been you're called to do? And these are good questions. What are you eager for and what are you unashamed? He's, he says, I'm not ashamed. Uh, what are you unashamed about? And uh, these are great questions for all of us, I think. What would happen if every believer in the Village Chapel or in all of the churches here in Nashville uh, began to think like Paul here, like a follower of Jesus, that they, they belong to him, that they're on mission with him, uh, that they are inspired to work together with, like Paul does, the unity of the body of Christ. I love, I love, I have, I have some friends that are pastors here in town of other churches, get together with them every month for lunch, now, some others I get together with uh, a little less frequently, but I love the other churches in our city. I think we've got some awesome churches. This is most church city in America, actually, statistically, from what I hear. But I love the other churches in our city, and I think it's great. Let's become eager and unashamed of the gospel of grace. 
in Christ Jesus. All right, this is our start. So we're leaning forward as we come back next week. You read verses 18 to 32. We'll finish up chapter one, and we'll talk about why God is right and why it's good for us that God is angry at sin and that his wrath is meted out on sin. That's a really good thing about the Christian faith. It's good news for us that he's a God like the kind of God he is, which we'll tell you about next week. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for this passage. Um, I'm sitting up straight myself, Lord, and spiritually, and I want to hear from you. Uh, and I want that for our church. I pray, Lord, that you would come, Holy Spirit, that as you've promised to lead us into the truth, I pray that you'd do that, uh, that you would indeed unify your church, that you would indeed send us out on mission, uh, your mission, not ours, but your mission in this world, that we join you in what you're doing, that our agenda is, is actually subject to and part of your greater agenda in the way that you want to uh, use us, Lord. We simply would place our lives at your disposal and that you would speak to us and through us here in Nashville as a church. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen.